Why did you pay so much? Free flop. Yeah. So I had a good hand. Me too. I believe you. Why didn't you raise? I didn't have that good hand. Yo guys, so I'm gonna review. I decided I've been deliberating which one to speak about. I was thinking about it. I think it's my second most favorite publicized public hands that I've ever played. The first one probably being my scoop main event heads up first hand. I'll put a link to that here if my editor knows what's what. Um, this hand is a hand I played against Leon Sukunik. He is an extraordinaire millionaire businessman, wouldn't be surprised if he's a billionaire. He's uh, an extremely charismatic and talented human being. He is a recreational poker player, although you may not guess it based on his plays. You might guess it based on some of them, yeah. But he likes to splash around, and that's the kind of player I love playing with, no matter if they're recreational or they are professional. So this hand, it is set in a 50,000 euro buy-in tournament event. It is played in Prague in an EPT. And to just give some context of this hand, Leon and I, we already had some history despite it being the first time we'd ever met in that, in that tournament. And we had a bit of a disputed, bit of a debacle on the first day where he was under the impression that I was angle shooting. I promise I wasn't, I never have. And I was under the impression that he was being out of order and he ended up raising his voice. I ended up raising my voice being like, no, you do not accuse people of cheating unless you actually have sufficient evidence because otherwise I think you're just letting your ego get, get the better of you. And he thought I was out of line. I thought, and then things calmed down, but there was still a bit of tension. And uh, he, he pulled this amazing trick, which I'm, I'm never gonna forget. And it was almost like it was his way of seeing whether I was up to the challenge of being on his level. And he goes, fine, fine, we can be fine, but uh, you owe me a drink. And I was like, yeah, okay, that sounds fine. I'm, I'm down, I'm down, I'm not gonna drink myself. I'll buy you a drink. So he gets the waiter over and he, he looks at the list and he goes, I'll take that. And he points at, I think it was a, I can't remember, was it 500 euros? It was either 500 euros or 2000 euros a bottle of champagne. But once you get above like a few hundred, your points already made. You've already ordered a drink. When it sounds like it's gonna be like a 30 euro drink, in, you know, for a nice one in Prague, uh, it's, it, he's already obviously going above it. And I was like, that seems reasonable. Order it for the man. And basically when it got there, he said, don't worry, I'll pay for it. And from then on, we got on and we managed to play some very, awesome poker we got a lot of sick hands between us but not all of them were managed to be televised luckily the final table he and i ends up first and second place he beat me heads up god damn it we got to win us at least a few sick hands between us so i'm gonna break down this one as my favorite one of my career in a live setting i think and uh, uh, that was televised at least and and here's how it goes he has ace eight of diamonds he's raised to 125,000, and once again a domination situation Shooking it with ace nine. Well, every Looks hand like a raise. So long super yeah, that's a three bet like from Chukinik on the button. Re-raising to 325,000 <laughs> gets a fold from Paul Newey it's in the small. Our, Pocket tens for Charlie Carroll in the big. I think very slowly as well, but everybody thinks. I didn't know everybody was thinking even slower than me. So again, these three players in this hand, the three guys who are in for two bullets, also the three biggest stacks yes, at the table. Ten hands. I think Charlie's going to be well aware how live this guy is. Just calls. Doesn't want to get into a situation where he puts in another bet and he's up against the monster. I think it's probably more <laughs> taking some ICM into consideration. Julia Thomas, very short stack. Do you really want to go to war with the biggest stack at the table when he will sometimes have you dominated? So pre-flop, you are helping an extraordinarily good finish. If I'm not mistaken, player opens the cutoff. I think with five handed with uh, five people left in the tournament and playing for a prize of like 600K or something ludicrous. Um, he opens the cutoff off 35 bigs from 60,000 to 125,000 with ace eight suited, very standard. Leon Sukunik looks down eight to nine off and he actually hadn't been playing too ludicrously with three bets. He had been a very post flop bluff heavy, barrel heavy, bet heavy kind of dude, betting big all the time. 
playing loose, calling lots of bets. Pretty, he hadn't actually been three betting too much, and that, that is pretty key when looking at this specific hand. He three bets to 325k. I actually really like it. He's been using his, he's using his image. He probably knows he hasn't been three betting too much. He is the big stack three band against the smaller stack. There's ICM implications. If you don't know what that is, then I can't help you because it's a long story. But it means he can pressure the one of the smaller stacks because they want to ladder their way up to the to the higher amounts of money. So he three bets to 325,000 off around 70 big blinds, and I'm looking down in the big blind with a 10 and a 10. What do you do? What do you do? Answer that. Pause the video and uh, try to think about it because it's honestly a, it's a, it's an interesting question. We're second in chips, and uh, you want to at least it, it doesn't matter if you get the right answer. You want to know if you're thinking about the right things to come to a conclusion. So here's what I'm thinking. I don't want to four bet get this in. You don't want to be getting tens in. If anyone tells you to do this, they're crazy. I don't want to be folding because tens, man. And I'm probably just about ahead of Leon's three betting range. I thought he was three betting quite a bit tighter than ace nine off, so I'm obviously way ahead of it. And the thing is that if I'm a better player than Leon, and this is hopefully something that you um, manage to think about, I actually have a post flop edge, meaning I'm going to be making better decisions on average, meaning that I'm the, the correct time is I'm going to realize more equity than I usually would, or I'm going to be winning pots more often than I should um, again against Leon. That's a very important factor. So another important factor, and this is something that people will not understand too well, especially the GTO bots, hashtag FGTO, is that even though it looks like my hand is going to be face up and I, I, I can't really construct a very good looking call out of the big blind range because it's not particularly balanced, I don't want to be calling like aces or ace king or anything like that, and it's just going to be a lot of kind of medium hands and I have a very narrow range, which GTO wise not the best thing to do usually. So Here's the thing that a lot of people, including uh, a couple of people, shout out to the poker guys, I love those guys, they, they didn't quite pick up on when they were reviewing the hands. I know lots of the top players still don't pick up on this kind of stuff. So even though I have a very narrow range when I'm calling out the big blind, Leon being a recreational player, or all due respect to him, he's an extremely smart guy, but he's not a professional, he doesn't know how narrow my range is going to be. And this actually comes into play later on in the hand. So we have to weigh up what my perceived range is, so perceived array of hands that I could have against what my actual array of hands will be and what we really need to be focusing when in the hand is what my perceived range will be and this is what GTO players often really don't understand it doesn't matter what my actual range is going to be what's he going to do learn what my range is and come back next time we're in a 50k heads up on a five-handed thing and I'm calling out the big blind gonna learn what my range is and my tendencies and exploit me no he's not but that is the kind of shit that the GTO players will be make you terrified of because they're like you need to balance your range you don't need to balance your range but you need to protect your perceived range or at least you need to be aware of it so we call helpy gets out of there it's a very good get out of there uh, it's uh, one of the best get out of there as I've seen it's uh, a spot where even though he's getting extraordinarily good pot odds, he doesn't want to be playing the big pot, this kind of ICM implication, these kind of ICM implications. And the main thing, he's very, very often dominated. You can see on this situation here, but often one of us will have like ace queen, I could call it a big blind ace queen from Helpy's perspective. He'll have a, a more succinct idea of what my calling range will be. And Leon could just have aces, kings, ace king, ace queen, ace jack, ace 10, apparently ace nine. So, we go to a flip heads up. And he also won't have a problem flipping it off. So here we go, heads up to the flop with you are healthy folding. It's queen eight four with two spades. Charlie, an 85% favorite post flop. Big pot or small pot? It's up to you. You're the one behind the wheel. Did he just quote William Kasuf? Yeah. Is that one of his lines? Big pot or small pot, it's up to you. What kind of energy are you getting off me at the moment? Well, that's 2016 for you. Interesting. The flop is queen eight four, two spades, and uh, we have two red tens, just to be clear. And it goes check, check. We're going to be checking 100% of our hands here. No need to get tricky. Actually, it might have been true. Let's think. Let's think about You're meant to be checking 100% of your hands here, TTOS, and I'm pretty sure I would. But maybe I might if I had something like a set, like eights or queens, I might, I might decide to lead it, lead kind of like. 150k because if i led 150k it stops him checking back with jacks it stops him checking back with tens and if he has ace king 
he'll at least call, maybe raise. And uh, if he has aces or kings, he'll most likely raise. So actually, I, I kind of like leaving a set in this box. So one of the things I, I want to point out is that before I checked the flop, which a lot of people would do instantaneously, I, I make sure to look at Leon's reaction at the flop. And this is something that if you're if you're adept at live tells, you're very used to doing. Like, okay, I want to make a decision whether to see bet. I want to know whether that person is interested in the flop or not. And it's not like an exact science. It's not like 100% this or 100% that, but you can with some people get like 90%. It's really, really shocking how much information people give away when they're just like looking at something as innocuous as a flop. Anyway, we have tens, we're checking. He's checking, take a turn. Leon checks behind. Another over card for Carroll, but he does pick up a straight draw. Leon obviously picks up the spade draw. Eight, nine, ten, Jack, straight flush draw, yeah? Indeed. Whoa! One minnow in deep asks, can you explain what implied odds are? Implied odds are the chips you can expect to win when you hit your hand super hard. Let, let's say you flop Medium a set ball. of 10s and Leon flops an ace. Your implied yeah, odds man. are that you're you're going to get his entire stack some of the time. <laughs> in case, um, but nice. Sam <laughs> is predicting a button click back raise here, but no, just a call. And oh. that'll take us to the river with more than a million in the middle. And it's the jack of spades. Now, our hand doesn't look particularly good um, in this kind of situation, and the standard is definitely to check. That being said, we do have a few tricks up our colorful sleeves, and as you may see in the video, I make sure that when I'm betting, or when I'm thinking about betting, I'm staring at him. And uh, although I tend not to stare too much, there's definitely a situation where Leon don't care, he's got sunglasses on, he don't, he don't give a shit what I do. I know, I knew him well enough at that point to know he didn't care. And uh, staring was definitely my bunch, because I there were a few things I was really trying to zone in on and hone in on that I thought were, he was really giving away a lot of information. And this is why I made the decision to bet. So I saw that when I was picking up chips, I'm not gonna say exactly what I saw, but I'll tell you how I applied the information. I saw that he wasn't exactly thrilled about the fact that I was picking up chips. And that to me means that he hasn't checked behind like ace, deuce of spades. It means he hasn't turned two pair like queen, jack or jack eight suited. And it means he hasn't turned a set like jacks. So now let's think about the hands that he could have from our perspective. So I think he's pretty, t he's gonna be playing pretty time, pretty, you know, okay standard face up in general in this kind of spot, in a big spot. That was my, my perception of, of the scenario. And I thought very, very often he had ace king um, because that's a hand that he would always three bet and a hand that he would usually check back because I, I knew his tendencies. He wasn't, he wasn't a C better with his air kind of hands. So on the turn, you can see that it's having a bit of fun. And I, I threw out a fishing rod and I pretended I was reeling him in. Um, the reason I did that is because I really, if he did have something like ace king with the ace of spades, I, I really didn't want him to raise because I, I just didn't want to, I knew I'd just end up folding even if I had a read that he was weak because it just wasn't going to be worth playing a huge pot just in case I'm wrong. And that's the thing with live tells, you need to, you need to be aware that you can be wrong about them and just adjust a certain amount. So I, I still wanted to portray strength, I didn't want him to raise and um, I, I got what I asked for. So Ace King, there's 16 combinations of that and half of them have a spade in, which is something uh, to be very aware of and uh, he, he'll have a bunch of equity if he does have a spade and still quite a bit of equity if he doesn't. We do block the 10 as his gut shot, but um, we still want to be protecting our hands. Other hands he could have, could be a jack maybe, if he checked behind ace jack or maybe king jack. But really, I, I actually thought he was gonna flat those most of the time pre, obviously he's three bidding ace nine, so that's not the case, but that was my perception at the time. And I, I would have given him ace jack preflop maybe like 20%, whereas I give him ace king preflop 100%. So that's something that you really want to take in mind. And here I just wanna go on a little, a little tangent where a lot of people say, well, if you're not playing GTO, how can you tell what's a good strategy? This is how you tell what's a good strategy. Count the combinations of, of hands that they can possibly have in their range and look at your perceived range in their eyes, what you think they're, they're gonna be thinking you have and make a decision, a very intuitive, but also logical and concise decision based on that information. You can play good explosive poker and you can play terrible explosive poker. You can't let these GTO people when they're arguing that GTO is the best thing in the world say that if you don't play their stupid balanced game theory optimal approach then you can't play good poker. It's one of the most common arguments for GTO and it's 
absolute balls. Anyway, so we decided to bet 275,000 into a pot of 830K, not quite giving him the odds with Ace King off, maybe with the spade, yes. But we're also getting value from Ace King with no spade, which is quite important. And the thing is, if he does have Ace King with no spade, here's my thought. Let's pretend he's got Ace King of clubs. I wanna keep him in the pot. I do, because on the river, if I know his exact hands, I thought very often it would be Ace King. We can do some real funky stuff. We can value that tiny or maybe get a bluff raise out of him if we do bet small. We can, if a king comes, we can bomb it and then fold him off his hands so it doesn't matter if he hits an ace or a king. We, we, can, we can play some pretty fun poker. Plus, I don't mind him sticking around because I've got live reads and away we go to the river. And it's the king of spades on the river. I mean, that is just a really bad run out for two tens, no spade. Overcard, overcard. Spade, spade. At the risk of looking silly on TV, I bet 650,000. Just about half pot. Please do not make me look silly. All right, so the river is the king of spades, and it's a bit of a brutal one for our hand, obviously, and this is where I'm pretty sure most people will give up after speaking to a lot of people about it, especially against Leon himself. It looks like he's gonna have a lot of the ace of spades. If he, if he does three bet, he could have ace jack with the ace of spades. He could have ace 10 with the ace of spades. He could have ace king with the ace of spades. He, I don't know, man. He could check back ace four with ace four of spades, ace deuce of spades, who knows? It looks like he can have a lot of very good hands at least, but, we have live reads, and again, I'm not going to tell you exactly what they are, but you can tell that I'm not bullshitting you when I say that I had live reads on him because I spent a lot of time looking and thinking. So on the river, I realized that my hand was never going to be good. He could easily have ace-king off, and that's just being nice. I, I really can't think of a single hand apart from off-suit nines that, that we beat. So I now need to make the decision, do I turn my hand into a bluff or do I just give up? If I didn't have live reads in this situation, I really, it would be a much harder decision. Um, he has a lot of spades in his hands and if I bet and lose a pot, it's really a lot more detrimental than it, it often would be because of the ICM implications of Pippi Lohan and a bunch of other stacks. That being said, I did have live reads and I tanked a very long time before deciding to make this bet. And as soon as I decided I was gonna make this bet, let me let me phrase it like this. Throughout the whole tank, I wanted to maintain the facade that I, I had a strong hand just in case I wanted to bet. And when I decided I was gonna bet, I went, okay, here we go, full throttle, let's speak. And I said, I don't wanna look stupid on TV and Honestly, it doesn't matter too much what I say there. It, it's more the fact that I'm speaking. Often it, it can matter what you say, but in that specific scenario, and I'm not gonna go into detail of why I think that, it's more of like an intuition than an articulatable thought, but it, it matters more that I said something and that it appears strong instead of me saying anything particular. In fact, if I said something like, oh, I've got the ace of spades, I think it would actually be significantly worse. So as soon as I bet 650,000 on the river, my read is confirmed and I find out Leon doesn't have a particularly strong hand. He looks extremely uncomfortable with my bet. And here's a little tactic that I used to do, which I can say now, because I'm not playing live poker anymore, is that if I made a bet and I wanted to talk my opponents into folding, as soon as I bet and they, you know, a lot, a lot of people there are like, damn, and I'll start, start thinking. As soon as I saw that, I would go on an explosive round. Like, yes, he doesn't have the quads. He's not got the quads. I'm good, boys. I'm good. I mean, oop, uh, oop, sorry, I didn't give anything away, did I? And I wouldn't do this against everyone. I know there are a lot of Timmies at home sitting there being like, <laughs> if he did that against me, I'd see straight through him. I wouldn't do that against you if I thought you were the kind of person to see straight through me. But there's a the type of person who isn't gonna see straight through it. There's a the type of person who's gonna be one level above, two levels above, three levels above. It's the fun part of it and the more you get, the more you speech play, the more you get good at it. And uh, I've speech played a lot. Leon's the kind of person I thought he was gonna be on a level where if I it went explosive, he would assume it was gonna be uh, a strong hand. That's not that's not dissing Leon. It's more the fact that he, he and I didn't know each other. He just saw me as some kid in colorful clothing. That is the face I wanted to see, ladies and gentlemen. This is the face of Leon without a straight flush. We're in business. <laughs> without a straight flush. I mean, take a look at Charlie Carroll's haircut. He does not give up easily. Actually, it's, it's not possible for you to have a He is committed. That is the How face is it not Leon. possible? Uh, possible? No reason, no reason. Why? It's possible to have straight flush, no? Yeah, yeah, sure, why not? You have a ten of uh, spade and ace of spade, or what do you have? No, no. 
So after I went on my explosive ramble about how he didn't have a straight flush, which is obviously just a ludicrous thing to say, like I never thought he could in a million years have a straight flush, Beyonce says, ah, without a straight flush. And this is where I saw an opportunity, I saw a window haven in front of me, and I decided to say something I'm very proud of saying. And I said, well, it's not actually possible for you to have a straight flush, I'm not sure you can quite hear this on Joe Stapleton's rambling. Well, it's not quite possible for you to have a straight flush, but, and then I paused and waited for him to interrupt, and he went, not possible. And I said, oh, no, I mean, and I, I pretended it to be all flustered, and I was like, I, I, I pretended to be the, like just a little kid that called out giving his hand away. And this is a theme that throughout the tank and throughout the speech play that happens throughout this hand, um, I, I kind of play back on, like I, I've already planted that seed of doubt in his head that I have a, either the nine or the ten of spades. In my head, I was repping the nine or the ten of spades. I had no idea he had the nine of spades. And to just give you like a, a little taste of what kind of player Leon is, a very, very extreme, I I'm probably gonna say his name, a, an extraordinarily good player called Fish2013 said he watched his hands back and he found it fascinating because he gave the chances of Leon folding like 2% uh, of this specific thing. And I, I think it's usually under that. I think if I didn't say anything, it would be way, way, way less than 2%. I think like maybe one in one in 200 times he might make this fold if I if I just stay still and, and hadn't done anything. He really wasn't much of a folder. So this is something I, I really want to speak about without coming across as egotistical because I, I know that when people speak about hands that they've done well in, it can often come across as egotistical and I really don't want to. Part of being a good poker player is being able to recognize what you're bad at, your leaks in your game, but it's also being able to recognize what you're good at. And speech play and live reads, it was kind of my thing, you know, it was, it was what put me above other people, it's what, what kept me afloat in the in the super high roller scene and, and essentially made me cross the super high roller scene. It wasn't because I'd put loads of time into studying, it wasn't because I was just like a super genius, it was because I, I had figured out my way of reading people and making decisions that other people were incapable of making because they didn't have the same data coming in. Building up that kind of intuition where you where you do a lot of speech plays, you see what works, you see what doesn't work, you, you really start getting this subconscious feeling of the energy of the situation and what kind of things to say and when. And every single thing I said during this tank, it was with a reason. There was You wouldn't find me saying anything just blindly. And it might not be saying specific things like I've already mentioned, it might be saying, it might be when I say something. And I'll, I'll go over it, another cool hand I have with Dapati Katai one set. Uh, at some point, that was an amazing hand based on just that concept. So when I was saying, no, no, I don't have an ace in the space, I, I was just getting, I was portraying the image of a kid that was flustered about the fact that he was given his hand away. What I was doing during during this hand, it wasn't that I, I was like a mastermind just thinking, oh, if he, if, I, if he says this, I'm gonna say this, or maybe if I say this, he'll think this. I, I was really just trying to feel what it would be like to be some naive kid that was just given away his hand willy-nilly that had said he had ace 10 with the 10 of spades or had said he had, said he had the 10 of spades and now was just annoyed um, but that he had given away the, his information but he was still happy that he was going to win the hand. You can't quite see this in the footage and Pokestars have deleted the original footage for some reason but as Leon was counting out a call um, I decided to spark up the dialogue. It was a really really long decision that he made and the reason I did that is I wanted to distract him from talking himself into a call. Usually when people are counting out a call they're talking themselves into a call Usually when people are holding their cards and looking at them, they're talking themselves into a fold and you can generally decide whether you want to spark a dialogue and say, you know, try and change their mind or you can just let them do it. And then if people are expecting you to, can, to do that, you do it the other way around. It's really fun. What do you think I have? I don't think that you have uh, uh, ace 10 and, and you have a 10 of pick. 10 of spade. 10 of spade, yeah. And you can't beat that? I can't. Damn. That's good news for me. Very good news for you. I tend to just get there on the river. This is kind of my style. But it can't happen all the time, right? Yeah, it's a big, uh, big uh, pot. Yeah. You know. At this point, um, just a bit of context, Leon and I had played quite a few hands and I'd rivered him a couple of times and he was already quite annoyed about that. And the reason I said I tend to just get there on the river, I remember at the time, is because I wanted to kind of reinforce the idea that I was just some lucky kid and he could fold and just be like, oh, the kid got lucky, he beat me on the river. What can I be bluffing with? I could have 
Jack 10. No? What bluff do you think I can have? Two red 10s? I can have Jack 10. <laughs> you paid, so you, have, you must have ace. Or pre flop. Mm hmm. You must have ace. Ace with what? What bluff? Ace with something. Ace nine? Ace queen? I could bluff ace queen. Ace <laughs> queen? It's terrible if ace is a spade. Yeah. yeah. I bet on the turn. I was pretty happy with my hand. So at this point, I start to try and help Leon break down in a kind of like range analysis. He's not really a range analysis kind of player, but I, I wanted to kind of like force feed him and just like get get my foot in the door so he, he can he can walk through. And I wanted him to realize that actually in this kind of situation, once I call out this, the big blind, I really can't have too many bluffs at all. And I wanted him to be aware of that. So I, I, I asked him, what kind of bluffs can I have? And then I started listing just some random, random ass bluffs that I'm obviously never going to be bluffing with in his head, at least anyway, I might actually be bluffing with a couple of them, uh, like Jack 10 and Queen 10. And the reason I wanted to do that is I wanted to portray again that kid that was just trying to convince Leon into a call with just some dumb logic. <laughs> I can count them. I own a casino, thank you, I can count them. <laughs> There's about a lot of green, I would say. What kind of read are you going to go for? You do it. Why did you? Why did you pay so much? Free flop. Yeah. So I had a good hand. Me too. I believe you. <laughs> not, not really, Leon. Why didn't you raise? I didn't have that good hand. So when Leon says you paid, and he means free flop. Um, so you must have ace. Um, I, I pulled a little face. I don't know if you saw how that. Kind of like, ah, oh, yeah, you caught me out, and then like pretending to like change subject, but like, well, what else do I have in my ace? And it's just the kind of thing that I thought he would think a kid in my position might do if he'd like guessed my hand correctly. Here, I'm, I'm not sure if what I said was exactly uh, like super perfect. I said I bet on the turn, um, so I was very happy with my hand. I think what I said was a bit too obvious. Um, luckily, he, he didn't pay too much attention to it, but I, I, I wish I'd said something like the level above that. I think that what I said was actually a bit too obvious that I was just trying to be like, I had a good hand on the turn. Um, I wish I'd implied it instead of just directly stating it. So at this point, um, <laughs> I was kind of shitting myself a bit. I, I made some funny faces to the camera, which they didn't show me, just being like, I like doing that stuff on live TV. And he was counting out a call. So at this point, I really have to hammer hard on the throttle. Let me, let me explain why. So let's say this is Leon's decision -o meter I mean, this analogy, so bear with me. Um, let's say that over here is him deciding to call and over here it's him deciding to fold. It looked like at this point that it was slowly creeping up to him deciding to call. So what you wanna do is when, when the decision -o meter is over here, you want to be making a lot of noise. You want to be doing something that's gonna increase the variance of the situation. So let's say you can do something that's going to make him either think that it's going to be that I'm really strong or make him think that it's really weak. He, it's like a 50-50. If it's over here, that's either going to push it over here or it's just going to push it further over here. Whereas if it's, you know, here, it could push it either way. And if it's here, it could push it that way or, or that way. So like if you increase the variance and just to do something extra dramatic when you when he it looks like they're about to call you might be able to push them further back and say if it's here you don't need to do something as crazy to push it over here and it's just kind of like a a nice metaphor that you can think about just how, how to conceptualize the idea of when to speak and when not to speak when to keep your mouth shut so what i was trying to do in this scenario is just act really confidently just be like yo spread it I don't give a fuck. There's a lot of green in there. Who cares? You know, just kind of like the blase, nonchalant kind of laid back guy with the nuts. <laughs> and I asked, what kind of read are you going to go for? And I'm sorry that I'm going into so much detail, but this is really a detailed scenario. And I, I promise I'm not just exaggerating how much detail that there is to analyze in the, this kind of specific spot. I said, what kind of read are you going to go for? Because I wanted to bring his attention back to the fact that he was going for a read instead of just making the gut decision that he usually always, usually always did which was cool. I wanted him to remember that he was making a read because 
Leon's the kind of person that he wants to make a read, he wants to own you, whether it's a hero fold, a hero call, it's usually a hero call, or just like a big bluff. He just wanted to own people. He had that kind of egoic thing about him. I loved it in him. I had it myself back then. And it is really something that can make a, a very impressive poker player. So I wanted to bring the conversation and bring his mentality back to him being able to own me by making a read. So at this point he asked why why I paid preflop and then why I didn't raise like four bet preflop he means and I wanted to just answer his questions relatively honestly but at the same time I, I wanted to make sure that he could see that my hand was just going to be in that board you know I'm going to have a king queen or jack and a big spade you know um, and I wanted him to not be able to come up with any kind of hand that I would possibly be bluffing with. The fear was that he might just like think I might just have something like, I don't know, ace five of diamonds. So I, I needed to make sure, I needed to reinforce the, the idea that I had pretty strong hand preflop just so he didn't think I could have complete air. Um, also, I, I wanted to reinforce the idea that he I could have ace 10 with the with the ace of spades or ace 10 with the 10 of spades. 10 of spades was the one I was kind of kind of rooting for because it's the one that he mentioned and I wanted him to be able to think that he'd own me again. Um, but just really trying to keep my range wide and the ace of spades or the 10 of spades or even the nine of spades in my head. Um, and if he wants to decide I have ace queen with the ace of spades, then so be it, do it. If he wants to decide I have ace 10 with the 10 of spades, so be it, do it. I don't want to narrow my range to just one hand, um, but just like, keep a open perceived range of possible not to tans like now could be buff could be bluff yeah could exactly. be could be what five minutes in the tank leon jack 10 jack 10 most likely you want me to believe in a bluff i can have jack 10 i can have eight nine i can have queen 10 maybe i love it when they name their actual hand when they do this do it say it i got two red tens Ten of spade nine I mean, that wouldn't be a bluff, you know? So Leon specifically says, you want me to believe in a bluff, which uh, it means that it's working. It means that we're on the straight and narrow, we're on the way home. And instantly I reply back with, um, I could have A9, I could have Jack 10, just started listening around the bluffs that I probably wouldn't actually have. And the reason I did this is again, I, I thought this was the kind of thing that he would expect me to do as just a kid that's being caught with his hand in the cookie jar with an obvious, He's given away his hands and now I'm just trying to backpedal really quickly. So I'm just really reinforcing, like psychologically reinforcing the idea that he has made a correct read. He sussed it out. He's about to own me on TV. At one point he does say, do you have the 10 of spades again? And I'm like, nah, nah. And it's just kind of like a, a reaction that I, again, I, I think he might expect me to do if I did have the 10 of spades, like, nah, nah, nah. And, and then say, oh, yeah, that wouldn't be a bluff, Mick. Just kind of like brush it off, you know? You have Ace King? Thank you. No? No, I don't. No. Better? Hey, maybe Leanne will pay everyone's game. overtime. Yeah, 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 yeah. It depends which street we're talking about, but at the moment, better. Too bad? King Jack was in. So at this point, I ask him if he has Ace King, and looking back, I think it's not the best thing to say. It's it's definitely okay. Like the fact that I was speaking is still good. It still portrays confidence. But at the time, I really thought he might just have Ace King no Spade um, because I, I really didn't expect him to three bet as wide as Ace Nine with the Nine of Spades, and I thought he would have like called that by now because he, he really really kind of stressed how much of a coolie person he was. So what you really don't want to do in these kind of situations, uh, which is what I do here. Is is you don't want to like guess their hand but under guess their hand so they feel like they're silly for tanking with such a strong hand so what i and you can do it the reverse against people who are on the level of blah 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 but in this kind of situation what i probably should have done is guess something like the nine of spades even though i didn't think it was likely here the nine of spades just because then if he did have something like ace king or king jack he might be like well, yeah well, i don't want to don't want to call with king jack if i've been if he thinks the nine of spades is a tank you know that kind of thing that people don't really don't want to look silly on tv most people anyway the reason and just just like try and try and back up why i did it even the thing is a mistake uh, the reason i was trying to say his exact hands is because often if you say someone's exact hands it's something to remember um they don't want to just pay you off because then they feel like they've been super owned if you're just like do you have king jack 
and they call with King Jack and then people get to see it on TV and they're like, wow, he guessed his hand and got value. Wow, he must have really super owned it. Like people don't want to do that. People tend towards folding if you guess their exact hand. That's what I was trying to do, but I think it was a, it was a mistake and I, I probably underestimated. I, I, just, I just didn't quite analyze the situation well enough. Obviously he has a nine of spades and I think with it, with just bare risking, he probably would have folded by now. As long as they're talking, I don't mind taking time. I feel like we're gonna have to call a more friendly clock. More interesting. Clock. That's okay. But in like a friendly know, clock. In anyway. ten minutes. I just want to try and rush your decision. Uh, I feel like you might be working it out. Friendly clock has been called. I don't know. Big Nick's coming to the table. So just over six minutes into the tank, I, I tell Leon that I think we're gonna have to call the clock. Honestly, I, the main reason I wanted to do that is because I wasn't sure if it was gonna call a fold at this point, but I wanted to just get over with it. I was getting a little bit bored. Not bored, but I, I was getting restless because the clock was ticking down and when you're a good player in a tournament, you don't want to waste loads of time because then the blinds go up and it becomes more luck. Um, and I, I didn't think saying, calling the clock would change much. I did, however, add a little thing at the end, friendly clock, because I didn't want to turn it into like an ego thing, me being like, call the clock, and him be like, fine kid, I call. You know, it's, it's just kind of thing that if you if you turn it into like an aggressive atmosphere or a defensive atmosphere, people are a lot more likely to do the aggressive or defensive thing instead of the passive thing. <laughs> it looks pretty small, whatever happens. I yeah, think. sure. What? Okay. But I don't have 10 euro. <laughs> yeah, I think so. <laughs> I no, I really, I cannot bet, I don't have money. So this is the, the, the last thing that I, I think is worth mentioning in the hand that I say, and um, it's something that I think was really key. I, I, I told Leon that he's going to look really smart whatever happens. This is, the reason I did this is because I really wanted to play to Leon's kind of like self-worth ego, the, the kind of wanting to own people thing, and just reinforce the idea that he'd already guessed my hands, that he was going to look really good on TV, he'd already owned me. And obviously, again, it looks relatively transparent, but I didn't feel that he was the kind of person to expect me to be on the level above, or like the level above just being a naive little kid. And I didn't think he was gonna be thinking of as high a level as maybe some of the, the more well-versed um, speech players may, like uh, Scott Seeger, for instance. I fault. He falls! Charlie Carroll! Yes. Kind of spade. You rapscallion! We did it. He folded. Call me Daniel Negreanu. I talked my way into a fold. Feels good, man. It feels good. Well done if you made it all the way through. This is definitely one of the more detailed analyses that I'm, I'm going to be doing. Um, I wanted to just give you a little insight into how much complexity there can go into, into the speech play. It's not just random donkers just throwing around words and saying things willy-nilly. There, you really can tailor this skill and it can, it can give you a huge edge where other people won't have that edge. And the swing in that, in that specific spot was probably like 50K. I'm not saying me speaking was plus 50K EV, but if I'd bet, I'm pretty, and not said anything, I'm pretty sure it would have folded. And I think by speaking, I, I gave it at least like a 60, 70% chance of him folding. It's obviously impossible to actually quantify that. I might be completely off, but that's just my intuitive guess at the situation. Um, so if you have any questions and if you have any criticisms, please let me know. I don't want to just have people just be like, Haha, I would have called and I don't want any negative comments. Just like, you're a fucking idiot. Look at your clothes. Like, I get it guys. You're angry. You're on YouTube. You want to vent just before you go off and kick your girlfriend. <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. But seriously, it's just, uh, I read all the comments. I read every single little YouTube comment. And um, just because I, I really want to get enough feedback for, for my YouTube. YouTube videos and I, I want to make better content and not a single time whilst I've been in real life or at the poker table if I had someone go up to me and be like ha you stupid dumb fuck you dumb kid you bad at poker not once but I get it every day on YouTube and I'm not saying like oh woe is me but it, it, it does like great on you sometimes it depends what mood I'm in usually I laugh but sometimes I'm, I'm, I'm in a just not the not the best mood and maybe a time bit vulnerable because something's happened in my personal life and I don't like it I've got to be honest I don't like the negativity and I'm gonna strive Drive to uh, eventually create such a pos positive atmosphere and such a helpful, I want to be such a helpful content creator that that shit is just going to be in the past. And guys, if you do see anyone posting any negative stuff in there, call them a negatron or shout, it in the <laughs> shout you out in the next video. Anyway, that's it from me and getting a bit tired. Peace out guys.